There we go. All right, good evening, brothers. Thanks everybody for joining in. This is our, our first in our Brotherhood Engagement Series that we're gonna be doing next week. Uh, we're gonna do Sigmas in the Arts. We'll have a panel discussion with uh, brothers who are in the arts per se, the visual arts, uh, recording arts, uh, discussing what they do, how they do it, how they've uh, changed their passion and actually turned it into profit. So, but tonight, tonight, my brothers in the state of Florida, we are absolutely blessed. We have our international historian, Brother Mark Pasich, with us here tonight. Uh, as you all know, he is Florida homegrown, you know, born here, bred here, as they say, uh, crossed at the world famous Zeta Kappa chapter at the University of Florida. Oh this brother, if you don't know him, then you must be a Neo. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be a Neo. Outside of being our international historian, uh, he's one of the founding members of the Unknown Step team. Um, he has served as our past state director. He has been our regional historian. Like I said, he is the current international historian. He is the founder of the Sigma Museum. And it's, it's when you get to the point that you are known by one name, then, then you, you know you've made it. You've made it. And You've everybody made it. down here just called referred to him as Mallet. If you say Mallet, everybody in the doggone fraternity pretty much knows who you are talking about. So that means you have made it. So, brothers, I'm, I'm blessed and honored that uh, I met him. And he is probably, uh, no, probably too, but he is the reason I became reactive at Gamma Delta Sigma chapter. I had this brother come and walk up to me in a public parking lot. He saw my tag on the back of my old Crown Vic. And he says, uh, so what do you know about A. Langston and Charles I? And I looked at him like, what you know about some A. Langston and Charles I? And got into a conversation. He said, hey, I'm a member of GDS here in Orlando. Uh, we meet second Saturday at Holden Heights Community Center. You should stop by. I didn't come by that month, but the following month I did. And I've been there ever since. And that's, that's as they say, a few years ago. So appreciate you, bro, for, as always, shining your light wherever you are, you know, showing the, uh, the love for the brotherhood and reaching out. And with that, uh, also grateful for him spending some time tonight. Uh, got to see his lovely wife, Natalie, is home, uh, and his, both his kids. Uh, and so he's taking time away from them to be with us. So we're very grateful to have him here tonight. And with that, brothers, our international historian, Brother Mark Mallet Pasich. All right, Brother uh, Grant, State Director, thank you very much. Um, how many brothers do we have in the room? Right now, we are sitting at 21. All right. All right, yeah, like once again, you know, thanks for inviting me. You know, I love doing these sessions. Um, I love doing them in person, of course, but circumstances, you know, dictate that we have to do it this way at this point, which is fine. Uh, I do these sessions a little bit different because of, you know, the technology and the way it's set up. Um, most of it is a question and answer type of uh, forum. I know there's brothers uh, in the room that are a lot older than me, you know, some younger than me and then some in the middle, which is good. It gives, you know, a broad spectrum of the brotherhood. Um, it's always good to have newer members or neophytes in the room um, so we can expound on what they've already learned, introduce new things that they've never heard of. And, you know, they have that thirst for the history. You know, they're welcome to ask questions and everything. Um, Ruben, if I understand, you'll be the moderator. So after I go through the little part that I'll go through here, if brothers want to text you or type or ask questions in the room, you know, they're more than welcome. Um, I have a list of questions here that were submitted to the state director prior to this meeting. And I, you know, I went through them and some very uh, common questions, nothing really that stood out that I've never seen asked before. Um, some of the answers will be short and sweet. Uh, some of them, I could take three hours and answer them. And, you know, I, I know we don't have that, but I'll try to do my best. Um, uh, I, some of them I'll probably script, 
skip over because I uh, Brady Talley probably asked about 12 of these. So I'll have to, <laughs> I'll have to like condense some of these. <laughs> but, um, and no, they're good though. They're good. It, they they uh, reach a, a uh, large um, concentration within the fraternity beginning to end. I mean, they're really all over the place and that's really not a bad thing. Um, for the brothers that don't know me, uh, I can tell you that as far as history is concerned, you know, I'm not a history major. I didn't study history in school, but I've always liked old things. I've always liked archival things, you know, the history channels, you know, stuff like that. And as it pertains to the fraternity, I can tell you, and this is one of the questions that could take three hours to answer, but I got interested in the, the history and preserving and collecting the history because I don't know if a lot of brothers know, but in the history of the fraternity, there's only been three historians. Yeah. And from 19, the late 1950s until about 12, 13 years ago, we had no historian. So you're talking you know, 50 plus years of nobody documenting or collecting or preserving, researching in a large scale for the benefit of the fraternity. 50 plus years, nobody did that. So you can imagine all those decades going by of brothers passing away or physical items being lost, burned, you know, water damage, destroyed, um, and, you know, lost through time. That's quite a bit of history for one organization to lose. So I noticed one that we didn't have a historian for all those years. So I was really behind the eight ball, even if I wanted to do this on my own. And then when I was traveling with the Unknown Step team and we were going all over the country, performing in the biggest shows in every state, and you talk to the brothers and you, you spend the night at their apartment or their house, you go out to eat with them, you go to chapter functions, you're at the step show, the after party, and you're just talking back and forth. I noticed that of all the seven regions that I went, it was almost like we were seven different organizations because the things that they learned, and it didn't matter when, it didn't matter if it was the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, but the things that they learned weren't the things that I learned and vice versa. And then sometimes we would butt heads because I believe something to be 100% true. They believe something different to be 100% true yet neither of us had any proof to back it up. So I got really disgruntled, really uh, embarrassed, really, uh, you know, just not sad, but, you know, I just couldn't believe it that we're like seven different fraternities, yet we're all the same, you know, letters, we're all the same motto, we're all the same principles, but nothing really bonded us other than the basics. So, I took it upon myself to, I want to collect the oldest stuff. I want to collect one of a kind things. I'm going to scour libraries and archive departments and universities and older brothers, you know, homes and go talk to them, interview them, go to auction houses, estate sales, do whatever I can, you know, visit the national headquarters, go into the basement, do whatever I could to start to collect whether I had to buy it or it was given to me permanently or on loan, make copies, it didn't matter. I was just gonna collect as much stuff as I could. And then when I finally started collecting this stuff and I was finding some gems, excuse me, some things that were believed to be lost through time that I decided, you know what? I need to share this with the brotherhood. I don't need to hoard it. I don't need to be the only one that knows it. I don't need to be the only one that experiences it. So that's when I decided on a Sigma museum that would be a traveling museum that could go to state conferences, uh, leadership conferences, regionals, national conventions, conclaves, it didn't matter. You know, something that could be open for the brothers as well as the general public. Cause I also made a commitment to not have anything secret or sacred in the museum in case some non-Greek walked in the room or a Zeta or a Delta, 
you know, they could enjoy our rich history without seeing any secrets or sacred, you know, items that we had. So I believe the, what was it? The first year I displayed the museum was uh, 2000 because I started this quest really like in the late 1990s. And the first time I ever displayed the museum was in Orlando at our uh, leadership conference on the campus of the University of Central Florida. And, you know, brothers were just blown away because they had probably not seen or experienced these items, probably 95% of them. Yeah, you would have a brother come through and say, oh, that's the crescent that was out when, you know, I crossed. And that was about it. But there were about 300 other items he had never seen before. So, you know, that's really why I wanted to do it. And then brothers that were like-minded like me, they were interested in the history and preserving the history. They contacted me, and this is before social media. So it was just phone calls and emails and actually handwritten and postmarked letters that we worked as a team. It's myself and six other brothers for the most part that are from all parts of the country. And we just started to work together. They would interview brothers or collect things. Or if I had a lead somewhere in Virginia, I could call them and say, hey, this guy in Virginia, go talk to him. He might have a lead for this. And, you know, we just worked together as a great team. And we've been working for almost 20 years, you know, with each other. So that's pretty much how the museum started. My goal was always to have it in a permanent location. And for a while, most of it, and there's still some stuff there, um, is housed in the international headquarters. But at this point, we don't know what the future is with the headquarters. You know, they're talking about remodeling it, moving it, selling it. So, you know, it's kind of in flux right now. Um, a brother asked, when will the museum be displayed again? Uh, the goal was to actually display it in South Carolina for the conclave. But because of COVID and because of limited attendance allowed, and just the logistics of the whole thing, it didn't make sense to do it. But I like to display it at least once a year somewhere, whether it's a regional or a, a conclave. I've actually had the items that I display flown and shipped for conclaves, for conferences. I prefer that I actually drive them within an eight to 10 hour uh, you know, distance. But uh, hopefully after this whole COVID nonsense is over, or settles down to the point that we can meet again in larger numbers. Look to see it at either a, you know, a state, leadership, regional conclave, or even a separate you know, history conference. Um, a brother asked, what is my most prized item in the Sigma, Sigma Museum? And there, I don't think there's one item, but there are particular items for particular reasons. And I pulled aside uh, four items to show brothers. And these are items that I always show a lot. So if you have seen my uh, workshops and my seminars before, you know, you've seen these items. But for the younger brothers and the brothers that haven't, you know, I have little stories to tell for each one of them. Um, these items actually belong to the family members of the brothers that, you know, they belong to. Um, these are family members that through tireless research and luck and the grace of God, we found these family members, just perseverance and really, you know, not taking no for an answer or not giving up if mail was returned. Um, but one of the um, items I have here actually belonged to the um, family of A. Langston Taylor. And it belonged or was in the possession of his great grandniece. She was actually directly related to A. Langston Taylor's sister. But she was eight years old when A. Langston Taylor passed away and she remembers him well. She told me some personal stories about him and the intera interaction with the family. And I always ask the same question to these family members, you know, do you have anything relating to him? Do you have anything Sigma related? Do you have anything, you know, relating to his profession or just any personal item? And I'll hold this up. I hope you can see it, but it's a picture of A. Langston Taylor as a graduating student from Howe Institute. And on the back of the picture, 
it says uh, A. Langston Taylor, Memphis, Tennessee, 1909. And 1909 is the year that he graduated from Howe Institute in Memphis, right before he entered um, Howard University in 1910. And this is a prized possession because it's probably the only one in existence. It's not a copy, it's an original, and um, it's pretty good for its age. But this is probably the youngest, or it's definitely the youngest picture we have of A. Langston Taylor in, in our possession. Um, she also sent me a uh, handwritten letter that was written by A. Langston Taylor, and here it is in the frame. It is from 1910, is it 1910? Yeah, December 28th, 1910. So this is prior, of course, to the founding of the fraternity. And it's a personal letter from A. Langston Taylor written in his dorm room at Howard University. And it's a letter written to his sister, Mrs. Ida Taylor, who lived in Memphis. And basically, the gist of the letter is he's thanking her for a Christmas present that she sent him. And the fact that one of his uncles sent him a silk tie that he would wear. And it's in it, this letter pretty much explains the personality of A. Langston Taylor because he says in the letter that a bunch of guys were in the room and he opened up the box and he saw the tie and he had to act like he had seen one before. When in essence, he was probably amazed that someone sent him a silk tie, but he had to act like, oh yeah, I get these all the time. And he says in here that it's a role that he has had to play for a while. Meaning that the way I take it is he had to play a role up at Howard because he did not come from a rich family. He did not come from a well-to-do family where most of the university students did. And A. Langston Taylor really isn't from Memphis. He's from Somerville, Tennessee, which is in another county to the west of where Memphis is. And he was born on a farm, a very large farm to a very large family. And in the census records that I have from that time, he's listed as one of the only family members that could read or write English. So I see it as A. Langston Taylor was like that golden child that was going to be you know, the pride of the family to be sent off to get that higher education, to go to the Black Harvard in the East. And at Howard, coming from those, you know, meager beginnings, he had to play a role that he was, you know, maybe more well off than what he actually was. Uh, we know that Anne Langston Taylor was admitted to Howard University as a special student. Those aren't our words. Those are actually the university words and even his words in our history book. We don't know what that means. We don't know if he was on some type of special scholarship at that time, if um, he was there just, you know, by the grace of the university allowing him to go, his grades weren't good enough. We just don't know, but we know he was admitted as a special student. And one thing a lot of brothers don't know about A. Langston Taylor is that he did not graduate from Howard University. Um, he did go there from 1910 to 1914, but after 1914, um, Howard University pretty much asked him to leave. Um, he worked for the school newspaper, and we have a newspaper article that states that A. Langston Taylor no longer is affiliated with the newspaper or the university, and all communication with them must cease immediately. So we don't know what happened, but I kind of equate it to, you know, when you're on your college campus and you have that pro fight that lives in town and he comes to your set or your plot for like eight, nine, 10 straight years. And you're wondering, is this guy even in class? I think A. Langston Taylor was that guy. That he was just hanging around campus, wasn't in class. And they were like, all right, buddy, your time is up, you know, move along. But he did graduate, you know, in 1922 from a uh, Freilinghausen University in Washington, D.C. Um, somebody asked, uh, outside of A. Langston Taylor, did we have any other collegiate national presidents? You know, that's kind of a weird question too, because like I just said, in 1914, we're not sure if A. Langston Taylor was even a student. 
Um, he definitely did not graduate. So if he was in school, yes, he was a collegiate. Um, but, you know, Arthur uh, M. Clark um, was also a collegiate president. He went to uh, Morris Brown in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't think we'll ever have a collegiate president again, mainly because of the dynamics of society, dynamics of business, the schools, the fraternity. I just don't think it's feasible. I don't know how understand how anyone could be nowadays a national president or even a regional director for that matter without being retired, semi-retired, almost retired, or owning your own business. Um, another uh, prize possession is from the family of Walter Edward Ricks. This is an original membership certificate from 1914. This is not a copy. And it's dated May 4th, 1914, which means Walter Edward Ricks was in the first initiation class of the fraternity. So you had the three founders, the nine charter members, and then the 14 first initiates. W.E. Ricks was one of the first 14 initiates at Alpha Chapter. It's signed by the uh, general president, A.L. Taylor, the general secretary, L.F. Morse, also the chapter president, A.L. Taylor, and the chapter secretary, L.F. Morse. And as you can see, uh, there weren't that many brothers around to uh, hold office. So <laughs> they kind of, you know, held everything. As far as that certificate's concerned, it's interesting that there's no motto listed on the certificate. Uh, it doesn't even mention Alpha Chapter as a name. But the most important thing about that is that it says May 4th, 1914, which goes to prove and cement the fact that that was the crossing date of our first initiation class that's listed in our history book. Um, and then this last item I'll show you is from the family of uh, Jesse W. Lewis. Uh, Jesse W. Lewis, um, very active member in the uh, Virginia area of the early days of the fraternity. Um, one thing that Jesse W. Lewis, other than being an international president is known for, is being the first member of the Distinguished Service Chapter when the DSC was established. And this brothers is his DSC key. This is the DSC key number one. Um, on the back of it uh, is the date of December 30th, 1929 with his initials. And I, I would say, you know, this one right here, you know, this is irreplaceable as well. You know, there are things that were irreplaceable, one of a kind, priceless, rare, and scarce. This right here, I mean, when I found out that his son had this in his possession and his son didn't know what it was. And when he described it to me over the phone, I just got chills because I said, I know what that is. Would you be willing to send it to me? And he did send it to me and it verified it. I knew what it was, but it's just amazing that these things lasted. They're sitting in, you know, people's basements, attics, closets, under their bed, and they're still out there. Um, I would say of all the items in the Sigma Museum, our holy grail of what we have not found in my opinion, are the two issues of the Phi Beta Sigma, Phi Beta Sigma Journal. Um, the first issue of the Crescent Magazine was March 1924. But prior to that, the fraternity um, drafted up, publicized, or um, they, uh, yeah, they were printed and sent out to uh, the Brotherhood two issues called the Phi Beta Sigma Journal. One was in 1921, one was in 1922. And myself as well as my history team and even older brothers going back to you know, R.O. Sutton and brothers even before him, they had never seen those issues. We know they existed. We, we kind of have an idea of what was in the pages of those issues. But I think if we ever found those issues, those issues and what is 
contained, I think would answer a lot of questions we have. I think there are some clues in there and some things that would finally put to rest some of the questions we have as far as the earliest days of Alpha Chapter. So um, those are our holy grail that we're always searching for. I am very confident that they still exist somewhere, that somebody has them or some archive department has them. Um, but you know, we'll just see, we'll just see if they ever turn up. Let's see what else. Okay. A brother asked, who are the other members in the photo at Howard with the founders? Now I'm assuming, and I'm probably ass assuming correctly, that they mean this picture. The one at the top right here. This is as we are taught the um, earliest known photograph of the fraternity and Alpha Chap. And I would say with all certainty, the brothers in that picture are the three founders, the nine charter members, some of the nine charter members, and some of the first 14 first initiates. We do know that that picture that contains Charles I. Brown was taken before he left. And he graduated early June, 1914. So he left around fall, 1914. I believe that with the founders and charter members, and then the first 14 initiates in May, I believe that Alpha Chapter had a line or a initiation class very soon after that, maybe even the same month of May. And the reason I believe that is, there are brothers in this picture that are in the 1915 and 1916 yearbooks, and they are not members of the first 14. They are not charter members, and they sure aren't the founders. So I'm kind of on a quest. I'm kind of confused on two or three brothers in this picture. I'm in the same text, right? I'm sorry? Uh, there are some brothers in this picture that I can verify in some of the early Howard University yearbooks, yet they're not members of the first initiation class. So it's a little strange. I can personally, I'll try to show this to you, name these brothers. So you have S.P. Massey is here on the end. B.A. Matthews is next to him. Charles I. Brown, A. Langston Taylor, Leonard Francis Morse. Here's W.E. Tibbs. I'm not sure who he is, 100%. J.R. Howard is here in the second row. I believe this is Jacob E. Jones. This is, without a doubt, T.L. Alston. Not sure who he is, but I think I know. This is Trenner T. Beckwith. He was on the first initiation class. This is J.A. Franklin, the football player. This is A.M. Walker, the first initiate. He was in that first initiation class. He would probably be, as we would label, number one, the ace. Directly behind him is Charles S. Adams. In between them is Eugene T. Alexander the first editor of the Crescent Magazine. In the very back, this short gentleman right here, he is actually standing up. He is very short. I have other pictures of him. Thomas H. McCormick. Um, and then these other brothers, I think I know who they are based on your book pictures, these three. And this is W.F. Vincent. Right behind J.A. Franklin is W.F. Vincent. W.F. Vincent is what we believe to be the first brother to join the Omega chapter. He uh, actually passed away in 1917. Now this Thomas H. McCormick, I like to talk about him because he's one of those early brothers that wasn't a founder or charter member that actually went on and was active in the fraternity his entire life. He went to go teach and become a professor at Tuskegee Institute. And he would go to regional conferences. He would go to conclaves. And I always knew that because the old conclave photos, if you look at it, he's always in the front row standing up because he was so short. 
he was probably four foot 11, five foot, five foot one, probably no short, no taller than that. But um, one thing I do notice in that original photo is I personally believe that uh, one of the most active charter members, I.L. Scruggs, is not in that photo. And we don't know why he's not in there. It's kind of like a running joke that he was there because he was the one taking the picture. But uh, we know he didn't take the photograph either. But we just don't know why he's not in the photo. But we know there's at least two brothers missing from that photograph. Um, trying to give me a second here to look here. Uh, brother asked a question, did we always have line names and numbers? If not, when did that start? What's with the ship stuff? <laughs> well, I can answer that in, in different parts. Um, line names and numbers, I'm very confident to say that no, we did not always have line names and numbers. And no, it always didn't go the same way, meaning there are chapters, for whatever reason, lined their brothers up shortest of tallest. I have known chapters that have lined them up tallest to shortest. And I also know chapters that just didn't care and it just looked like a sound wave. Tall, short, tall, you know, tall, short. So, I mean, there's just different ways that and different histories and, and uh, uh, method, methodologies that, you know, chapters did, you know, to suit their own purposes. Um, the whole concept of lining up shortest to tallest is African in nature as far as uh, rites of passage with young men becoming old men. Uh, there was a story that um, Brother Gerald Smith uh, told me that there was one African tribe that the men, young men would enter the, 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 um, the woods or the jungle or whatever it was, shortest to tallest. And then when they went through their rites of passage, when they came out into the village, they were tallest to shortest. So they switched, you know, once they crossed and whatever they had to do. So that concept is, you know, strictly African in nature for the most part. Um, I don't know when the line numbers or the line names actually started. I mean, I've seen it go back all the way to the 1930s, 1940s, um, mostly the late 1930s. Not saying it didn't happen before that. But you have to realize that from about 1914 to 1940, 1935, you really didn't see brothers or black Greeks for that matter, wear letters, wear, wear fraternity jerseys with their line name and numbers on. They really didn't even wear letters. They were mostly dressed in suits 24 seven. You know, they would just, a normal day, they're wearing a shirt tie or a suit. That's just how they dress. That's the style they had. So the whole line names and numbers probably started, you know, after the 1940s. As far as um, the ship terminology, SHIP, um, you know, that started in the, um, you know, the Great Lakes region. A lot of brothers in the Great Lakes region still do it, still hold on to it. They have their reasons for doing it. I remember when I crossed, you know, next week, it'll be 30 years that I didn't know, even know what that terminology meant. And, you know, our state director who was made in that uh, region can, you know, expound on it further if he wishes, but it's just something that's relative to that area of the country, I'm not saying other chapters don't do it. And I'm sure they have their reasons, but it would be the reasons that they've come up individually. Nothing in our fraternity history has stated, you know, specifically anything, you know, pointing to that. Um, oh, so going back to the museum, uh, a brother asked what made me start the museum and what was my first item? A lot of brothers don't know this, but other than the items that I personally own, that I got at conferences or, you know, or were gifted to me or whatever, the first item that I purchased that I don't even display in the museum because it got destroyed, but I can replace it, it's not a problem, was a uncut sheet of George Washington Carver stamps. And that was the first item that I actually like went to like eBay and purchased and framed. And because it related to George Washington Carver, not Sigma specifically, 
you know, and as is important and, you know, influential as he is and was, you know, I just had to have that. So that it was an uncut sheet of the uh, U.S. postal stamp with George Washington Carver on. Um, Ruben, would you like to expound on the um, ship concept? Uh, sure. Actually, uh, interesting timing because one of my ships just joined on here. <laughs> yeah. Easy. Uh, D.L. Dean down there. Um, yeah, in the Great Lakes, um, we are considered uh, Sigma ships. You'll see, all the lines you'll see are start SS. So I was on the SS Gladiator. That's the Sigma ship Gladiator. Our number one is not an ace. He's a captain. Our tail dog is an anchor. The the guy in the middle, who me, you, you consider a midship. So we we're all shipmates all on the Sigma ship, trying to cross into, or cross the burning sands into Sigma land. So that's kind of the quote unquote kind of aspect of it. Uh, now where it started, uh, bruh, uh, it goes back from my chapter, which started in 78. And I know brothers uh, from Chicago and in, in that area uh, much further uh, than that. So uh, it's been there for a while. That's kind of like go mob. <laughs> it's just one of those things. True. All right. I appreciate that. Thanks. Um, did let me ask you this though. Um, your pro fights that brought you in and everything. Were okay, let me ask you this. Were you aware that other parts of the country didn't use the SS terminology? No clue until uh I started road tripping and actually went out to the eastern region and uh, uh was out in New York and met a bunch of bros out there, and uh, none of them were ships, they were sands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, and then, we, you know, we can get into Go Mob um, with the Great Lakes region as well. Um, we do know that Go Mob started in the Great Lakes region. We also know that when it was originated, it was not a secret word. It was actually printed um, on banners, on chapter banners and stuff like that, written all the way out, every word. When it became secret, don't know. Um, we do know, and we can narrow it down, GOMOP started between about 1977 and 1979. Um, I don't know if there was an individual brother that came up with it or a chapter. I'm sure there's 100 Sigmas out there who claim that they invented it. They're the one. You know, it is what it is. But um, it's not in any ritual book. It's never been in a ritual book. It's never been an official term or symbol of the fraternity. It's been adopted worldwide as far as, you know, pertaining to us and what we, uh, you know, want it to mean. But uh, I want the younger brothers and the older brothers as well to know that it, it originally was not a secret and why it became a secret and when we just don't know. Um, uh, let me see what else. Uh, brother asked here, where was our international headquarters before Kennedy Street in Washington, D.C.? That's a good question because before we had our official headquarters, which was um, actually purchased and finalized in the late 70s um, in DC, it was actually in New York and specifically Brooklyn, New York. And even more specifically, it was in a upstairs office above a garage at the end of a driveway at the home of uh, Bill Dorr which was our um, first uh, national executive secretary, which became the inter uh, international executive director. And he served in that position for 33 years. Uh, Bill Doerr passed away in uh, 1982. Uh, I never met him, although he's uh, definitely a, a role model of mine. Great but man. He, he, yeah, he actually kept all the records of the fraternity at his house and you know his wife and his family helped him and he had you know his secretary and everything but it was an upstairs office above the garage at the end of his driveway in the back in Brooklyn <laughs> and everything was handwritten I mean they did telegrams you know there was no email social media you know they probably had a phone that Alexander Graham Bell made or whatever but you know, he kept the records as best he could. And some brothers will say he kept them better back then than they do today. Um, 
I have I have a lot of uh, Bill Doerr's personal items, a lot of his personal ledger books, uh, a lot of his receipt books that he, when brother sent in dues and he did the receipt and mailed it, I have like the carbon copy sheets. They said Bill Doerr was so on point with the financial records that if he met you at a conference or he met you in the street, if you told him his, if you told him your name, he could tell you right then and there if you were financial. He knew if you were I'm financial. Mind. So, and you know, you look at this old uh, looking white guy at these conferences, every conclave, every regionals, every, every, wearing a bow tie. And the fact remains he wasn't white, but even the general public believed he was white. And, you know, I had to ask his family, did he have, a, you know, biracial parents? And they're like, no, he just comes from a family, very light skinned, you know, at some point, yes. But, you know, he was always confused of being white. There is actually a story in Jet Magazine and I believe it's from the 60s. And it's a little snippet that Jet Magazine has, and it's about Bill Doerr. And I could tell you this story, that he was flying from one conference to another, and he stopped at the hotel bar. And he stopped there because he was waiting for brothers on a connecting flight to meet up with them, and they were going to get on the same flight. So he's at the bar. He orders a drink, some food or whatever, and they're, you know, he's enjoying all that. So the brothers come up after they land and they come up to the bar and the bartender tells them, I'm sorry, we don't serve the N word here. And it, it, it was written out. We don't serve the N word here. And Bill Doerr was just taken aback because him being a black man, but passed for a white man. You know, that's like the life he had to lead, you know, in all of this. So it's just interesting. You know, uh, another thing about Bill Doerr, he was a very proficient bowler. He um, was a member of a long-standing bowling league in Brooklyn, New York. There was actually a Sigma bowling team. He was also the basketball coach for the uh, inner city Sigma basketball team. Very active in his church. I mean, there's a reason why his nickname is Mr. Sigma. There's a reason why our international headquarters is named after him. Now, Bill Doerr is also the kind of person that brother, brothers ask, well, if he was so good, if he was all that, if he knew everything, why wasn't he ever national president? Well, the truth is, he never wanted to be. Um, he was content to where he was. He was very content with the work he was doing. And he was probably one of those brothers that, in a narcissistic or egotistical type of way, he was probably more influential not being the national president. He was less scrutinized not being a national president. And he probably figured he could get more things done and maybe even be a power player in the fraternity by not being a national president. So that, that's just a little story about him and our headquarters. Um, yes, it was in above a garage at the end of a driveway for many, many years. Um, my brother asked, did the Kappas really ask to combine with us? Well, of course, that's an urban legend that's in our history. That's one of those things that I personally believe happened. I 100% believe that the Kappas wanted to merge with us in the 1920s um, for a very valid reason, that they were very strong and growing in the Midwest. We were very strong and growing rapidly in the East and the South. And with, you know, World War I just ended, Chapters were depleted, memberships were depleted, you know, racism at an all time high, survival was essential. And I believe the Kappas, you know, to no fault of their own, they, they saw survival as something that this might be the only way that we survive. Now, as far as a letter being written to Anne Langston Taylor and him graciously declining, I personally believe a letter existed. I have never seen it. Um, I don't know anyone that has definitely seen it. I have had a few brothers tell me they have. I don't believe them, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I think if the letter ever existed, I do not think it exists now. Um, even though we've had the headquarters in D.C. since the 70s, 
Since then, there was a major flood and a major fire in the headquarters. And because of that, everything prior to 1939 was destroyed. If you go to our headquarters now, unless I loaned it to them or gave it to them because it was in my possession, the headquarters has nothing prior to 1939. Um, it's just the way it is. It's a shame. That's just why, you know, chapters need to preserve what they have and brothers need to preserve what they have and safeguard what they have because, you know, all it takes is one spark, one flame, one broken pipe, you know, and you just, you got to take care of your things, you know, digitally record them or, or save them, you know, put it, put those CDs or whatever you have in a safety deposit box or somewhere safe. Because, you know, these things, these old items that are over, you know, 107 years old or 100 years old, very fragile. Doesn't take much to damage them. Um, traveling with the Sigma Museum a couple of times, I've had some frames break. Luckily, the items in the frames and the glass, you know, didn't damage them. But, you know, things happen. Uh, brother asks, and this is a good question. It's not that none of these aren't good, but this is really good because it's specific to her state. Rho Sigma and Alpha Eta are the oldest chapters in the state. Can you talk about their founding? How the fraternity spread throughout the straight state? Well, I can tell you, um, Ray Smith could probably tell you about the founding of both those chapters in 1927 you know, or whatever in 1935, because he was around then. But um, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll try to help you. Uh, a lot of brothers don't know that our first state director was uh, Leonard Francis Moose, our founder. He was our first state director. And when he came to our state, you know, he lived in Tampa, he lived in St. Petersburg, he lived in Jacksonville to the end of his life, that one of the prime directives he had was to plant and grow and just take care of Sigma in Florida. And that's exactly what he did. And we know for a fact that a I mean, Leonard Francis Morse founded at least nine chapters in the state of Florida, at least nine, Alpha Eta being one of them. Um, not so sure if he had involvement in Rho Sigma because I don't believe he was in Florida at that time, but he definitely was part of the Alpha Eta's uh, founding in 1935. If brothers in the state, if you just think about it, think about how many chapters we have that start, alumni chapters that start with the word gamma. Gamma, eta, sigma, gamma, delta, sigma, gamma, gamma, sigma. Just think about that and the 1950s time frame that they were chartered. The reason is Leonard Morse went all over the state chartering these alumni chapters, finding graduates that were Sigma men and chartering these chapters. And we know, and our fraternity history even says it, that he chartered at least nine chapters in the state of Florida. That is how the fraternity spread throughout the state, along with him being a state director, along with him, of course, being an influential founder, and along with him being at Edward Waters College and the BF Lee Seminary in Jacksonville, Florida, and being the president of Edward Waters College for a year, just think how influential he was. And that doesn't even take into consideration how active he was in the church. So, I mean, Leonard Francis Morse basically was the reason Florida became so populated and so strong with Sigma chapters at such an uh, you know, early time period. Um, we are in the Southern region. Were there always regions or how was the frat organized in the early days? No, they weren't always regions, but they weren't isolated states either. Um, they were known as uh, districts, Eastern District, Southern District, you know, uh, the Great Lakes District. There were, I could go into it. it. I wish I would have pulled the Crescent Magazine where it describes it, but basically they were districts. And within those districts, those states did not remain 
when they became regions. And what I mean by that is basically Louisiana used to be part of the Southern region, along with, you know, Mississippi and Alabama and Florida and Georgia and the Bahamas, there was no Sigma presence there. So they weren't even included, but yeah, there's been some, you know, changing as far as the, the map is concerned, you know, with Tennessee being split in half and Louisiana going this way, the Lone Star District, the Lone Star region, you know, those things happened. Uh, I think they did the best they could as far as naming and isolating certain states for certain districts and regions. I mean, the way that we've grown and the way really the Western region is, there's probably going to be some changing in the future. I mean, you know, if Tennessee is cut in half, why shouldn't California? You know, you talk about state directors and area directors in the Western region. <laughs> in the Western region, you know, they, these guys got to travel like, you know, 30 hours to go visit a chapter. You, you know, if, if you're a state director, you shouldn't have to take an airplane to uh, visit a chapter in your state. So who knows what the uh, future holds? Um, it's a known fact that, like I stated earlier, we grew in the East and the South very rapidly. Um, if you look to where our single letter chapters are, you know, in Atlanta, you know, they, there were some in uh, uh, Missouri. And then you talk about DC and Virginia, you know, North Carolina, you know, they knew what they were doing. And, you know, they also had the benefit though of the historically black colleges and universities being located to where they were. One reason Sigma grew in those areas as well is like I stated with Thomas McCormick, when brothers graduated from Alpha Chapter, or they graduated from Beta Chapter in Texas, or you know Gamma Chapter in Virginia, they went to work if they were educators at the black colleges. So when they went to these black colleges at Fisk University and Tuskegee and you know Florida A and M and stuff like that, they were a recruitment tool and they helped Sigma grow. A lot of the archive departments at these schools, and I've been to a few of them, and I know brothers that have gone there for me, the ones that I couldn't get to, they are amazed that they have history of our fraternity going back to like the early 1920s. And the reason is because these professors that worked at these schools for so long that were Sigma men donated all their personal Sigma items to these archive departments. For instance, the um, Crescent magazines, at Tuskegee Institute. They have George Washington Carver's name handwritten on the covers because those were his personal Crescent magazines. And he was there for so long and was so important to that school. I'm sure his family donated all his items to that school. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, we were growing so fast and growing where we did. And that brings me, I guess, it's not a question, but it's kind of like a segue or it goes back to how did we become so strong, so fast, and so important at Howard University when there were other black fraternities there before us? And I just equate that, or I can answer that, I guess, in two ways. The first one is that they, when they took Charles I. Brown as being one of the most popular men on campus, and entrusted him to help go get the charter members. He went and got a wide variety. Not one man is the same. And he got athletes and scholars and linguists and you know all these guys that had all these talents. And he took from every part of the campus. So your initial class of men, your charter members were just a wide range of talents. That was the first part. But the second part in which the one I deem more important is they initiated Howard University professors as the first honorary members that didn't have to go through the rigorous trials of an actual pledge process or whatever they did back then. So they took these four Howard University professors you know, Thomas Turner and Elaine Leroy Locke being two of them, who were just scholars in their field nationally, they made them Sigma men. 
So not only did they have the best and brightest young men on campus who were students, they solidified and, and grabbed up and reserved and they did everything to get four of the most powerful professors on campus. So now the campus had their back, the administration had their back. That's why they were able to get a fraternity house so fast because the reason we were recognized by Howard University before Omega Psi Phi, even though they were founded there before us, was that Howard University did not want fraternities or sororities. They did everything they could to stifle that development. But as soon as we initiated four professors, four prominent professors, it was a done deal. It was a done deal. Yeah, that was the smartest thing that they did. Um, a brother asked this question here. I hear brothers used to be online for more than one semester. Is that true? Brother, there used to be brothers online for over a year. I've interviewed brothers of every decade. And when I say every decade, the oldest brother I ever interviewed was pledged in 1918 at Howard University, Alpha Chapter. I've interviewed brothers from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and all the way up. I've interviewed brothers that were online for five weeks, 10 weeks, 20 weeks, a year, year and a half, three straight semesters. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's why when you ask brothers, and I really don't, you know, fault them for it, but if you need a new brother and you ask him, you know, when he pledged and he can't remember, or he says something like, you know, 1934, 1935, you know, if, it sometimes, yeah, they don't remember and their memory's fading. Other times they were online so damn long, they might not remember what year they crossed because they probably can't remember what year they started. So you got to kind of, you know, take it with a grain of salt, and, you know, give some leeway. And you're not, you know, oh, he doesn't know when he actually crossed. That's because he plays like 80 years ago. I mean, I don't remember what I did 80 days ago. So you kind of just, you know, be patient with those older brothers. Now, I'm not saying be patient with like Zany Mountain, Ray Smith, and Sidney McRae and them guys. They should know the exact hour they went over. I'm not so, giving them any so, leeway. Uh, <laughs> so, <wasn't that? laughs> but uh, I guess that goes into um, this is a good question. This is, I, I don't think this has ever been asked of me. And I don't know if I have the exact answer, but I can give you uh, some answer. A brother asked, what is the age of the youngest Sigma May? And how about the oldest? Well, the youngest, I don't know for sure, but I know brother Mitt Patel at Zeta Zai at USF was at least 17, but he damn sure may have been 16. Because I remember he was number one on that line. And he was so young, I just couldn't believe it. Like it was, I was shocked. Like, how old are you? So I, he was either 17 and he might've been 16. I don't think he was 15, but he was in that age. And that's the youngest I ever experienced. Um, Mitt was 17. Zanny Mount just chimed in. He said Mitt Patel was 17 at the time. So to me, that's very young. You know, yeah, you probably have a lot of 18, 19, 20, but 17 was was young. Because I remember when I asked him, because he looked like a little kid. And, and when I asked him, I was just shocked, like, how old are you? So that's the youngest. Now, the oldest, I have the name on my phone. I should have wrote it down before I went to the Zoom meeting, because I feel if I come out of the meeting, I'm not going to get back in. But there was a brother in Washington, D.C. that was online in 1931 at Alpha Chapter. And he dropped line in 1931 because they threw acid on him. <laughs> Why they threw acid on him, I don't know. But they threw acid on him and he had it affected his breathing somehow or whatever. He dropped line. But lo and behold, at the age of 91, he finished the process with Alpha Sigma Chapter in I think 2001, he was 91 years old. So he probably started when he was like 20 and finished the process when he was 91. Wow. 
Yeah, that's, that's crazy, bro. That is crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he didn't hold a grudge. I mean, I don't know what he waited so long for, but man. Uh, I see in the chat we had a uh, uh, brother Chris Rice that chimed in about uh, Dr. Tony Bolden, uh, seventeen, also at uh, KU. Uh, Ubi says they had one cross hit at sixteen. Alpha Beta Iota had someone 16. So, yeah, oh, the, wow. the youngest I experienced was Mitt at 17. But, yeah, someone at 16, I, I could see that. I could see that. It's odd, very rare, but. What did he Chris came up Wright from do? the islands. Kimari he the island? came up from on the islands. Yeah, yeah. So he started <laughs> college early. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's pretty cool, though. That's pretty cool. Um, Let's see what our brother asks here that won't take forever to talk about. Uh, oh, okay. What are Sigma shadows, Sigma doves, and what happened to them? <laughs> That's interesting. All right. Um, auxiliary organizations have existed for a very long time, going back to like the 1950s at least. Um, they started to get their own names and own symbolism and stuff. Really in the 70s and the 80s, they were very popular. I think the boom, the high point of auxiliary organizations uh, was probably the 1980s. Um, I could be wrong because I know there were droves of them in the 70s as well. But in, in my experience, from what I saw, uh, there have been many names um, just for Sigma. There have been shadows. Um, there have been Sigma stars, uh, Sigma doves. Sigma Sweethearts. Um, I think they started, can't give you a particular year, but when a host chapter, let's say Gamma Delta Sigma is the host chapter for Conclave in Orlando. The host chapter committee would also have a wives committee. And a lot of times they were called shadows, Sigma shadows. And the wives committee were the wives of all the Sigma men. And they would have their own committee that came up with their own um, itinerary and their own planning and their own events that would facilitate the guests and the wives of other Sigmas that were traveling to the city. Now, I know the Sigma shadow term did not go over well because it seemed a little subservient. It seemed a little, you're in the shadows, you're not as important. Um, so that term, even though it did exist and was in print, that it did exist. And I think that's where the auxiliary organizations came from. Um, you know, the purpose of auxiliary organizations, you know, brothers could argue that to the end of time, some were good, some were bad, but, you know, being a chapter cheerleader, helping the parties get started, be the first at the functions, help recruit, you know, that type of stuff, that's all fine and dandy. But any brother that was a member of a chapter that had doves or stars, or sweethearts knows that it always caused conflict with the Zetas because, <laughs> you know, the Zetas are our sisters. First and foremost, you know, they are who they are and we know the bond. We know the constitution. Some chapters treated the doves better than they treated the Zetas. So as you can understand, a lot, a lot of times doves matriculated and became Zetas. I mean, when it worked, it worked. When it didn't, it didn't work and it was bad. And any brother that comes from those type of chapters can attest to that. Um, in the early 90s, I want to say around 92, all the national organizations got rid of auxiliary organizations just because of the liability that you had these hangers on that didn't have a constitution, weren't recognized by the university. If something happened, you know, who's responsible. It's a whole liability aspect. Some organizations got smart and petitioned to be their own organization on campus, excuse me, and came up with their own constitutions. I know the Alpha Sweethearts at the University of Florida did that. Right around that time that the hammer came down and was getting rid of everything, they quickly organized, got a constitution, got approved, and they became their own organization on campus still called the Alpha Sweethearts and nobody could touch them. They can initiate new members. They can have functions just like any other organization. And um, 
I just know for the most part, just liability, all that stuff went away. Yeah, man. I remember uh, Great Lakes. We had silhouettes up that way. Silhouettes, yeah. That's another uh, crazy. Thing. I remember some of the sororities had their own the Zeta Gents and uh, Sigma Gamma Romeos. Yeah. The Zeta yeah, Knight. I was a Romeo. Oh, God. The Zeta <laughs> Knight. I don't know why you admit that in a Zoom meeting, but I was hey, a man, I don't care. He was a great. Time. I was a Romeo as well. After being a Sigma, I was a Miyaka. Uh, this is before I even considered Sigma. And, uh, <laughs> but in this group chat, brother Christopher Rice indicated that he was 16 when he became a Sigma. Was he really okay? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, Actually, that was a uh, uh, Tony Boulder. Oh, Tony, yeah, well, Tony Boulder. I thought, was, I thought it was Chris Rice who wrote it. Yeah, Chris wrote it, but it's it's, it's Tony Boulder. Uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry, connection for Boulder. Yeah. yeah. Up in the uh, ATL area. Okay, so, um, yeah, you have, you know, the AKs have Miyaka, you know, the Delta Gents. The Zeta Knights were a group of men that uh, were actually at Bethune-Cookman for a long time. I remember the Zeta Knights. I remember, <laughs> this is funny, this is when I lived in Tampa. I was wearing a Sigma shirt, and, you know, I wasn't too far in the organization, maybe five years or so, and I was walking in the University Mall in Tampa. And up ahead of me, I see a group of like 30 guys and they all had blue and white airbrush shirts. And I saw numbers on the back and I saw line names and I'm like, oh man, there's a bunch of pros up here. So I run up there and I run past them and I look and I turn around and I'm expecting to see Phi Beta Sigma and it was Zeta Knights. And I looked at them and I was like, what is that? And they looked at me and they were like, uh, you're a Sigma? And of course, the way I looked, I could see why they were surprised. But I was like, yeah, I was like, what's a Zeta Knight? And they were like offended because like I didn't know. And then when I found out, I was like, oh, God, you guys are a bunch of cheerleaders. Get out of here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, um, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. But, uh, you know, all the organizations have them or whatever. The, you know, the Kappa Sweethearts, of course, were very prominent. And, you know, the, the movie School Days plays off of that a little bit you know, with the sororities and the groupies and, and that type of stuff. You know, most people saw them as groupies. Like I said, they had their pros and cons. And if it was done correctly, it was a good thing. But when it went bad and went south, it, it went really bad. Um, now, Mallet, you know, the, uh, the Kappas, you know, their wives are Kappa silhouettes. And that is their national auxiliary. I mean, you know, it goes all the way. They have a national president, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's its own auxiliary, but it's national within Alpha Alpha Psi. So, cause, yeah. you know, I have a lot of friends, family members, and, you know, their wives are, you know, capital silhouettes. And like I say, it's part of their organizational structures. So, yeah, I, I know the, the, the Sigma Shadows, um, and I, I heard this from Brother Robert Eason. He said in, at, in Atlanta, they were very big and very powerful. They were, they held their own. They, they did so much work. They were very respected in the community. He said, but the problem is, is that term shadows made it seem like they were secondary in the shadows, you know, subservient, you know, and that didn't go over well. But um, brother asked a question here that comes up at every session is, did Sigma give the okay for the brother to start Sigma Lambda Beta? Now, You'll probably hear seven different stories from eight different people. But the way it basically goes is Sigma Lambda Beta, which is a national fraternity that is predominantly Latino, Hispanic, um, was started by a member of Phi Beta Sigma in uh, Iowa. And I'm sure Brother Ruben Grant can expound on this um, after I'm done. But he was a member of, a, uh, of Phi Beta Sigma. And the story goes that he wasn't mad at Sigma. He wasn't disgruntled. He wasn't wronged or hurt. But he felt that his talents would be better served if he started it or belonged to an organization that did what Sigma did, but for the Latino community. And the way I understand it was that he didn't turn in his letters he didn't resign his letters. He didn't ask permission. Although some brothers will tell you that he wrote a letter to Gerald Smith, who was the executive director 
and requested being removed from our national role and not being a Sigma anymore so he could go and do this. Half the brothers you talk to will say he asked permission and it was granted. Half the brothers you talk to will say that he just did it on his own without Sigma even knowing. But the older brothers that I talked to in Chicago in the, uh, the mid eighties, because Sigma Lambda Beta was chartered or founded in 1986. And the brothers that were there tell me that they were very well aware that Sigma Lambda Beta was happening. They were very well aware that their founder was a Sigma and there was no beef, there was no static, there was no animosity, there was no, what are you doing? You know, we can't let this happen, are you crazy? Now I'm sure there were individual brothers that felt that way, but as a collective, like Charles Talbert tells me, and Ruben knows who, and Zane, you know who brother Talbert is, he tells me that they were very aware that the founder of Sigma Lambda Beta would like meet with them and they would talk, they knew who he was, and it was just something that he did. Maybe Sigma didn't know how to address it and something like this was brand new and they didn't know how to approach it or even know what to do. But I'm sure they were confused because to this day, I'm still confused on why he did it, even though I kind of understand. Um, I don't know, Zany, if you remember that uh, I was in Tampa when Sigma Lambda Beta got chartered at USF and they were the first beta chapter in the yeah. state of Florida. And I remember their coming out show. And of course, I was there with the younger guys and the guys my age, like Eric White and them. And we went to the uh, Marshall Center outside and they had their coming out show. And it was every race of human you could imagine, every shade of white and brown and black, every hair texture, every nationality. It was Correct. just it looked like the United Nations. And I mean, there were white guys, Mexican, black, African, Latino. I mean, it was the entire gambit. It, it looked like the United Nations meeting. But I remember being confused, like, okay, this is like a, I guess a Spanish fraternity, whatever. But Balthazar, their founder, who was a Sigma, was there. And I remember meeting him, but at, when I met him, I didn't know who he was. I didn't find out until later that he was the right. founder of the organization and he was actually a Sigma. Because best believe, if I knew who he was when I shook his hand, I would have pulled him aside and said, you got to tell me your story. You got to tell me. <laughs> now, he still is living. I mean, it's not like he has passed away. I've tried to get a hold of him a few times. The phone number I have doesn't work, but they say he's approachable, that he, he'll tell his story. He's not ashamed of it or whatever. But, you know, being a founder of an organization who's still living, I'm sure he's busy. You know, but Ruben, if you want to give some input at that time. Uh, I can I can give a little bit, but I actually my, my ship is on the line. He's actually state director. We, we've actually been talking about this the past couple of days because we talked to brother Paul Tomlinson, who was yeah. at the University of Iowa and was actually kind of the impetus uh, or impetus of this whole thing. Um, no kind of he was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, just to let you know, Malik. Um, just been talking to him quite a bit lately because, uh, you know, we came in about a year after uh, it started. Uh, talking to Paul, the reason that Sigma Beta uh, even exists is because of a comment or a conversation he had with uh, Baldazar and another Latino uh, Sigma that was uh, at University of Iowa. Uh, Baldazar wanted more uh, programs. He wanted Sigma to provide programming on campus for Latinos. Uh, Paul was emphasizing to him that Phi Beta Sigma is a black fraternity. And in that, we need to, we have to uh, follow the programming of the international. And that from that conversation, Baldazar still wanted to provide for uh, Latinos in the community. The same, uh, same principles that we had. He did not tell anyone on campus None of the Sigmas on campus that he was going through this. They did not find out until he approached the other uh, Latino uh, Sigma on campus about joining um, uh, the organization. And he denied it. That's when the rest of the chapter found out about it. Um, yes, he. so there was some contention as far as that goes with them. But even though the contention of how it started, 
there was symbi symbiotic information between them on campus. Paul did call nationals because nationals was not aware. Mm -hmm. And told, uh, and Paul's inference is he wanted them to stop Sigma Lambda Beta from st uh, be existing. The message he got from uh, nationals at the time was, no, it's okay. We're not worried about it. So permission was given by the negative of not following up to try to close down the organization. Okay. Okay. That's the best. That's the best firsthand, secondhand information I've heard. I mean, really, and and it makes sense. It, I believe it a hundred percent. You know, I think one of these days though, I am gonna talk to both of us at some point, and just as the historian, say, tell me your story. You know, and Malik, I will get you in touch with them because okay. uh, Paul does has has been in communication with them in the last five years. So uh, we'll get that, try to get that information to you. All right, appreciate it. And, and one thing that was really weird and going back to Zanny with uh, the USF campus was, even though we were kind of like, you know, what is this? You know, who are these guys? I remember that the members of Sigma and Lambda Beta that were there to help charter and make sure this got off the ground they went out of their way to come talk to us. And that was weird because we didn't understand why at first. They didn't go talk to the Kappas, the Alpha. They came over to us to shake our hands, introduce themselves. And we were like, yeah, we know we're special, but why are we special to you guys? And when they told us, they're like, we know all about your history because our founders of Sigma. We were like, what? What? You know, so it, and then it started to make sense. And no matter what campus I go to or if I see a Sigma Lamb debate on the street, if they know their history, they will go out of their way to talk to you if they know you're a Sigma. I'm not I've, saying ran in, I've ran into, uh, I guess, probably when I was still advising Zeta Zai, and, you know, one day at the mall, uh, a couple of, you know, the uh, members, you know, they wanted to know the handshake because allegedly there's a secret handshake between Sigma Lambda Beta and Phi Beta Sigma. And I had to tell the, the two brothers, I said, I'm very sorry, you know, I'm old school. You know, I have no idea whether there is an official handshake or not. I say, you know, I, I can't really help you, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, it was always, you know, and you know, they're referred to as the cousins, you know, mm -hmm. so it's always been a sort of friendly, you know, like like a cousin, you know, like somebody that's not your brother, but they're your cousin. But of course, they're not recognized internationally like that. You know, we have one family member, which is Zeta Phi Beta. So, um, yeah. um, I um, because I go through UT with uh, Alpha Beta Gamma a lot. I'm, I'm there with the collegiate. I, I run through USF once in a while with Zeta Zai and. One thing I gotta say about the betas, they give me a great deal of respect. They know that I'm a Sigma. They know my son because he's a uh, frat, but they always walk up to me and refer to me as Mr. Rivera. And they do give me a great deal of respect. So that's what you were saying, Brother Matter, that they do go out of their way to recognize us. I guess maybe because I'm an old school guy and they figure, hey, you know, let's give, give them that uh, level of respect. But they always do give me and the other brothers that I've seen some respect. Yeah, it's true. It's, and and really, to brothers that have never experienced them or associated with them, I would say you're crazy because if you've ever seen Sigma Lambda Gamma, <laughs> the female <laughs> uh, sorority, I mean, okay. yeah, yeah. So it it is what it is. It is okay. So let, let's go on to this next question because this is important. Um, somebody asked blatant, really blunt, what's with the wolf? As far as the symbol of the fraternity. So as far as symbolism in our fraternity and as far as an animal symbol, you know, the dove is the only thing that is sanctioned, recognized, official. Throughout the decades, you know, going back really many, many decades, different animals have been used to either describe or be associated with a chapter or a state or a region mainly a chapter, even as far down as just a line and something other than the dove has been used. I mean, I've seen a bulldog be used. I've seen a lion. 
I've seen a wolf. I've even seen and used a camel. Uh, the camel from the late 70s up until maybe still today is used. And But they're nothing official. And it's, for the most part, something that a chapter would um, integrate into their chapter mythology or their history. And other chapters would visit. And they're like, oh, I like that camel. That's pretty cool. Let me you know, put that on my gear or my paraphernalia. And then they go travel. Oh, I like that. And so it kind of spreads that way. And like I said, I come from a chapter that used the camel as well as the dove. And I was indoctrinated into that. But it's something as historian and a Sigma purist like I am now that I don't really use at all. I only recognize the dove. That's the only thing that's been since our beginning. That's the only thing that's, you know, mentioned in any type of secret or sacred uh, literature that we have. It's on our fraternity shield. It has meaning. And all the other animals and mascots, the wolf included, if brothers use them, you know, I kind of turn a side eye to it now. But the problem I have, and I've always said this, is that when brothers join this organization, they know that the dove is the only animal associated with us. If you don't like that, if you think that that animal is too weak, if you think that animal is too sissified or whatever it is, well, then you join the wrong organization as far as that is concerned because it's not up to new brothers to come in and change what is already established. It's up to new brothers as well as old to safeguard the symbols that we already have that have been here since the beginning. So when brothers and chapters give secret meaning to these other animal mascots or special meaning, or they create this mythology that intertwines into our fraternity founding, that is when I have the problem because now what you're getting into is what I said in the very beginning, different fraternities within the same organization. I have had brothers tell me that were no more than a year old in the organization, tell me that I came in the wrong way because I don't know the secret meaning of the wolf. <laughs> and that just like, I'm just stunned. I'm just, I don't even feel disrespected. I feel like how far have we gone? How lost are we that you've been brainwashed to the point just for your chapter mythology and your chapter history that you've pledged your chapter and it's more important than our fraternity history as a whole? You know, that's the, that's the problem I have. You know, where the wolf started, who knows? How long has it been around? You know, probably since the 70s. It probably disappeared for a while, came back in the mid 80s. You know, I blame the brothers from 1980 to 1989 of inventing everything <laughs> and bastardizing everything and ruining everything and, you know, just distorting everything. So, yeah, the brothers in the late 70s and all through the 80s, they were the best type of brother, but the worst type, too, because they were so just off the charts as far as inventing stuff and you know and i'm sure you remember reuben the black bart simpson and you know all that type of stuff i mean if it, went, it looked it was, cool we was taking it over <laughs> yeah if it looked cool we were taking it over and and there's <laughs> nothing wrong with borrowing from society or from culture or from what's hot at the time because i mean even all the step shows i did i've used every culture from asian to african you know, I've used every type of music from heavy metal to classical and everything in between. You know, you, there's nothing wrong from borrowing it. But once you borrow it and it's done, you wipe your hands clean of it. OK, it's done. But once you borrow something that's not inherently with Sigma from the beginning and you try to intertwine it and make excuses and reasons and you create false histories and you create something that sounds so cool. And a lot of the things do sound cool, but when you create all that and then you teach it to someone young, that's like a sponge. And then they teach it to the next person who's like a sponge. 
and it just festers and just, it's not good. It's not good for an organization that should all stand for the same thing. And some brothers may think, oh, that's petty. You know, let the young boys do what they want. Yeah, but that once you do that and they start chastising older brothers and saying that they didn't come in the right way because they didn't learn this, I mean, that's where it really causes a problem. Um, Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, brother asked, what is the origin of chanting or stepping? I could say chanting or singing predates stepping. Like I said, the interviews that I had with brothers, you know, from the 40s and 50s, they knew what stepping was because they had seen it currently. But during that time, they said it didn't exist in any organization. He said, because the one thing the brothers did was that they would stroll on campus. And when I say stroll, I mean more like march, um, march in cadence, you know, walk with some swagger. But the big thing that they did was sing. A lot of chapters that I talked to said that one of the things they were most proud of, one thing that they held in high regard, and they recruited brothers specifically for this, was brothers that could sing really well. Because there wasn't chanting, there wasn't stepping, there wasn't strolling, there was singing. And they would sing to the ladies. They would sing during their um, public uh, events that they had. And he said they sang more than anything. And then they would stroll and walk with swagger, walk with long canes and stuff like that, tell stories. And then that's when the chanting came on. And then when you have, you know, like the Vietnam War and the Korean War and the military aspect of uh, those type of things and marching in line with fatigues and the cadence calls and the, the actual chanting and the shouting back and forth, you know, I think that came from the military uh, in a large part, which is why in the 70s and the 80s, you see a lot of the military fatigues with the boots and the marching in line and stuff like that. And then with the civil rights movement, with the black berets and the, you know, the leather jackets and, you know, that's all, that was all taken from society and culture. And it, like I said, it was utilized with what Signal was doing. But as far as stepping, I can tell you the oldest step show I've ever seen, and it was on a VHS tape, was like 1977. Now, I'm not saying stepping didn't exist before that, but I'm just telling you what I personally saw on a uh, VHS tape. Um, then you have to ask yourself, you know, what do you consider stepping? Is just keeping a, a beat stepping or marching left and right stepping? Because then you could go even further back. But the stepping boom that happened definitely late 70s into the 80s the 80s brothers um invented probably the most steps that we know of today as far as our historical steps ones that are are, are you know the people associate with us you know with the nutcracker and sweat and wood and all that type of stuff um like i said i give credit to the 80s brothers for doing that um, but I, you know, the eighties brothers also were crazy and they probably had the most lawsuits of anybody as well. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> gotta take um, the good with the bad, bro. Good with the bad, good with the bad. <laughs> um, now as far as like, uh, brother asked about the origin, of the unknown step team, um, you know, that's a answer that's about three hours long, but I could tell you in short, um, myself and Eric Jaffe, uh, another white brother that pledged in New Jersey in 1988. Um, Eric presented the idea to me to do a all white step team made up of Sigmas to just do one show, one show only to make history, make a big impact, drive the crowd crazy and then go on our way. Well, we recruited some brothers, put together a show. And now granted, this is all before social media. So we had to learn through VHS tapes, mailing them back each other you know no tiktok no instagram none of that <laughs> no cell phones <laughs> for the most part other than ones that were in your car you know uh and we learned the show and we did a show in arkansas the first show for the unknown step team and after we did the show myself chris sarkeesian and eric jaffe 
we looked at ourselves and we were like, uh, we need to do this again. And then we did another show and we were like, we need to do this again. And then we formulated a plan out um, that uh, someone just said we cut them off the team. Who was that? It's Chris Rice. Yeah, Chris Rice was our road manager, but he was only our road manager if we went to like Vegas and he was there or we went to Chicago and he was there or wherever we were and he was there. He was like our road manager, but he didn't travel with us. If he was there, he was there. So um, <laughs> plus, I didn't know if Chris could step. He was probably horrible. horrible. He might have done our music a couple of times, but um, one show led to another and we finally sat down and said, you know what, let's take this big time. Let's do what the New York City step team did, which was the best step team at that time, historically, year after year. Let's do what the New York City step team did when they only did one show every year on New Year's in New York. Let's do what they're doing, meaning having the best steppers that we could find, putting and creating the most innovative steps that we could do, having the best themes, the most thought out shows beginning to end. And instead of just doing it like they did in New York, let's go every single place that we can. The biggest shows across the country. Let's just make an impact and just sweep everything. And that's what we did. And we did the biggest shows everywhere from the Philly Greek to the um, East Coast Step Show in North Carolina to Tennessee State's Homecoming to the Florida Invitational Show in Gainesville. I mean, it's just, we went everywhere. And I mean, when I stopped stepping with the Unknown Step Team, I had stepped in 37 different states. And the only states we really didn't hit were like South Dakota, North Dakota, you know, those type of states. And we really didn't hit them. We, Idaho, you know, even though we did do Iowa, <laughs> we did, you know, some of those backwards schools in the middle of nowhere of cornfields and stuff. But you know, wait, 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 hold, hold on now. <laughs> he must be talking about Cheney State. Oh, we, I, <laughs> I, I've stepped in Gamma Omicron. I stepped in Cheney. You said I've stepped everywhere. But um, we did the we did the big, we did the little. Um, of course, we did the shows that offered the most money. Um, it came to a point to where we were so successful that promoters would not allow us to compete in the step shows, but they would pay us to show up because they knew if we competed, one, we were gonna win or two teams would drop out. But if they paid us to show up to do the same show, then they could advertise we were gonna be there and that would be a ticket sale you know, explosion for them. We were at the point to where the promoters would fly us in two days early, just so we can go to the radio stations and do interviews. And that way it would help sell tickets. Um, one of the brothers, and I don't remember his name, but he, he said, you know, do you feel that you never reached the pinnacle or you were as big as you could have been? I said, we were as big as we ever could have gotten. I said, yeah, we could have been in movies or some, stomp the yard or whatever. I said, but when you have alphas and iotas arguing with each other because one of them is upset that we're stepping and the other one is like no you got to give them their respect nobody can beat them and they're only up there with three guys you got a team of 12 that can't beat them in your own chat your own university your own backyard you can't beat this team and you're upset no you give them their props because they're doing what no one else has ever done and then it got to the point where we had to change or where we had to add other brothers. And, a, you know, instead of three stepping, we had to get four and then five and then nine and then 12. We had to up our game because people would prepare for us and they would try to stay one step ahead of us. But we were always two steps ahead of them. And, you know, we would show up to some of these shows and they were like, I thought it was only three. Oh, no, nah, we brought 15 this time. So there was we could do more. We could experiment more. We can, you know, involve the crowd more. We could do more with our steps where three people, you were kind of at a disadvantage. But, you know, I told the brother, I said, I'm as big as I ever wanted to be. I said, as long as the frat appreciated what we did and respected us and we represented the frat well, that was the 
first and foremost. I said, but then when you have other Greeks fighting over you and defending you, I was like, that's the second step. And then when you have people come up to you and grip you up, they're frat. And they said, I pledged because I saw you step in Kentucky. And after I saw you step, there was no other answer for me. I was like, then we did our job because we were like this recruitment tool that we didn't know at that time we were. When we were sponsored by And One, the basketball company, we didn't realize that how big that was going to be. You know, when them idiots that did Stomp the Yard videotaped our show and put our steps in part of that movie, but didn't have us in the movie, we were like, oh, well, what can you do? At least our legacy somewhat is in that movie, as horrible as it was. But yeah, okay. When, you know, we're stepping for the Steve Harvey show, or, you know, we're stepping with Ricky Smiley and his show, and we're opening up concerts for Wyclef and Morris Day in the Time and Criss Cross and stuff like that back in the day. I mean, when you, you're now not just doing a Greek step show, you're doing concerts and you're traveling all over the country. I was like, that's as big as I wanted to be. And the brother said, well, what about social media? If you guys had social media, you would be 10 times as big. And I said, that is true, but that would be fleeting and that would only last this long. And he said, why is that? I said, because our whole gimmick was nobody knew who we were. Our whole gimmick was we had masks on, our bodies were covered, our hands were covered. When we were stepping, the whole crowd assumed we were black. When we took our masks and our gloves off and our shirts off, they're like, oh my God, they're all white. I said, with social media, with TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all that, one show is all it would take for the world to know who we were. And then stepping in another city, when we showed up, people were like, oh, I already know who that is up there. So there would be no reason to cover our faces. So covering our faces and our identities worked for damn near three years. Even though word spread a little bit here and there, and girls would call their girlfriends at other schools, be like, man, you got to see this team. You got to see this team. And they would send pictures. And so we showed up. Yeah, some people knew who we were. But if we did a show in Miami, and then the next weekend did a show in San Diego, and the next weekend did a show in Philadelphia, and the next show did a show in Missouri, it was a brand new crowd every time. So that's why we were successful. And I'm glad social media didn't exist when we were uh, traveling all over. Um, unfortunately, three members of the Unknown Step Team um, have passed away. Um, you know, our manager at that time um, also, uh, he also performed with us a little bit, uh, Larry Moses, who lived in Philadelphia. Also, Jamie Jacobs, he was a, a, a brother from uh, Philly that stepped with us probably half the time that we were together when a bunch of guys from Cheney University were on the team. Um, he was a brother, he passed away. And then our road dog, uh, Reggie Field, if you ever saw a step with just three, when it was me, Eric Jaffe and Reggie, Reggie was, me and Eric were white, Reggie was the black guy um, in the middle all the time. Reggie unfortunately was, uh, was murdered uh, a few years ago in Louisiana. Jeez. And we probably did most of our shows with me, Eric, and Reggie. So if brothers ever saw the Unknown Step Team during like, I guess when we were really gaining ground and, and really blasting off, it was me, Eric, and Reggie. And Reggie's the most recent one that uh, joined the Omega chapter. So you know, because of that, I don't know if me and Eric will ever step again. You know, it's just one of those things. You know, it's not the same. You know, you know, me and Eric have done shows by ourselves. Me and Eric have done shows together. But as far as like the unknown step team, when we stepped it, what was it, Centennial for our last show or whatever it was? You know, that was probably our last show. Plus, we're old ass guys with bad knees. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, ever, since, a... ever since I got my ACL repaired, man, I don't know if I could uh, <laughs> do a 15-minute show. Well, but, welcome um, to middle age, bro. There you go. Yeah, I turned 50. I'm definitely middle age. <laughs> um, we had a, a, a question in the chat here 
um, asking what you could tell us about uh, Cornelius Troop. C.V. Troop. Yeah, C.V. Troop was a um, a brother, very famous um, in Georgia. And he would travel throughout Georgia. I believe he was the president of Fort Valley State at, at one point. Um, he was just one of those brothers that was like at every meeting, at every conclave. Um, was every chapter knew him, every brother knew him. He was just one of those national brothers. He just happened to be local in Georgia. And one thing about uh, C.V. Troop was that he had a singing troupe because his last name was Troop, T-R-O-U-P-E. And they called it Troop's Troop. And he would be one of those brothers that would organize all the brothers that had singing talent to sing at conclave. You know, when you go to conclaves and you have brothers sing at the luncheon, or your brothers sing in the choir at Conclave. He was like that brother that would orchestrate all that and get the brothers together. So he was very musically inclined. I mean, I never met him. I only know about him from what brothers have told me and what I've read. But he was very prominent in Georgia. Um, I'm done with the questions on the sheet. So if any other brothers want to contact you, and you they can you can moderate it to me. Gotcha. Yeah, just put that in the chat there, bros, if anybody else has some additional questions. I just want to say something if nobody else does. Uh, I'm a little older than some of you guys. I'm 70. But uh, we were stepping in New York back in the 70s, like nice. early 70s, like 1970, out of Alpha Delta chapter and Del in, in Harlem and Delta Zia chapter in Queens. We used to go out to Orchard Beach in Brooklyn, and that's where the frats used to step. That's the first time I ever did any stepping. So yeah, that's good. To, that's good to know. Like I said, the the earliest one I saw was 1977, and and it's interesting if you think about it, it, it is um, impossible to prove when the first step show was. Impossible to prove who was the first chapter. It's like impossible to prove who was the first one to twirl a cane or whatever. You know, you just can't prove it. You can kind of just estimate it or whatever. Um, but you have to think about it at that time in the 70s. You know, if you were stepping in New York, stepping might not have gone to California until maybe 10 years later, you know, just because of communication and traveling and stuff like that. You know, you, you just don't know. I mean, you could be in New York, say, I mean, I've been stepping for 10 years. And a brother from Cali says, what's step? And that's just the reality. I mean, it's, because of technology and everything, that's not the way it is nowadays. But yeah, it's it, it's interesting. But you, you'll never be able to prove when the first step show was. You know, it's just it's not even worth looking for. <laughs> Definitely no nice that uh, Jacksonville Sigma. Somebody put in it. How did the international song get voted on, or kind of came about? Uh, uh, Jacksonville Sigma. Talking about. talking about the hymn, or are you talking about? Sigma got soul. Which one are you talking about, bro? He's still on mute. Uh, I don't know. Oh, oh, you talking about the uh, oh computer games? Computer games. Lord have mercy. Oh uh, well, that's not a national song for Sigma. I mean. Being that you live in Florida, that, that you might think that, but um, Computer Games by Yellow Magic Orchestra was, um, I'm going to have to say, the early DJs from UF. Um, and I, I don't know, uh, Peterkin, you still on here? No, nah, he had to jump off. Oh, man, he can answer that better than me. But um, the brothers from the early to mid 80s at UF played Computer Games, an instrumental song. And they would always play it to signify the end of the party. So if you had a party on campus or anywhere else and you had the DJ playing, when computer games came on, that signified to everybody that the party was over. And then that's when the Sigmas from the, in attendance there at ZK or whatever, that's when they would stroll and step around the party and, you know, just like anything else, it spread to Tampa, Daytona, Tallahassee, you know, Miami. And then visiting brothers would come in for Blue and White Weekend from all over the country. And 
if they liked it, they'd take it back and they'd use it at their parties. But it's really a Florida thing um, starting in Gainesville. But I wish uh, Dwayne was on here because, you know, brothers like Disco and Ernie B and Magic. And I think there's a DJ even before them that started it. But uh, yeah, that's when it started early to mid 80s. Hey, Mallet, this is Eric White. Hey, what's up, man? What's up? <laughs> I, re I remember coming down there when y'all played that song. Y'all uh -huh. would just mob up at the end of the party and everybody, it was like a mosh pit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we heard it. And at the time we was doing the hop because they did yeah. the international at the time. Yeah. And then we was like, oh man, we finna take that back to Tallahassee. Yeah, and, that, and that's, and really the way it spread was Blue and White Weekend. You know, when, when Blue and White Weekend started to grow and only brothers from the South really came, they took it back to Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. And then when it got even bigger and it didn't matter what state or part of the world you were from, you know, they, you know, you had brothers come from Germany, Alaska, Hawaii, Korea, and they would come in and it just, it's just spread like that, you know. But, you know, parties have changed and the dynamics of parties have changed. So I don't even know if brothers use it anymore. So I mean, it is what it is. It's just one of those things you you enjoy the time that it was there. And if it continues on, great. If it doesn't, it is what it is. We're still doing it right now. Uh, Brother Strozier uh, put into the chat, and we did not talk about this, is the history of the hand sign, which will also take us back to Zeta Kappa and uh, Brother Granberry. So. Yeah, you know, and I had the picture with me here. But... um. Yeah, the hand sign, um, as far as we were taught, you know, Brother Granberry, who uh, joined the Omega chapter a few years ago, uh, he plays in the late 70s uh, at UF. And there's a picture in the spring 1978 Crescent Magazine of Brother Granberry doing this on uh, UF's campus with the rest of the chapter. And the picture was taken fall of 77. And that's the first time in a Crescent magazine that the hand sign appears. And believe me when I say that, because I have just about every Crescent magazine ever printed. And the only ones I'm missing are from like the 1930s. And I know the hand sign wasn't back then. But um, spring 78 is the first time it appears. And, you know, talking with Brother Granberry, because I was very good friends with him. He helped initiate me. Uh, he was one of my mentors. He was one of those brothers that, didn't have to hold any position in any chapter or any state, yet he went to everything. He was at all the service projects. He was very respected by the brothers. He didn't care about any titles. He was just a brother's brother. He would give you his last dollar if he had it. I mean, he made a point to clear his schedule for Sigma events. And that's, that's just who Granberry was, man. He was one of the best brothers I ever knew. And um, I asked him, I said, you know, why did you do that? What does that mean? And it wasn't anything secret or mysterious or, you know, superficial or, you know, supernatural, whatever. He said, it was just, you know, I love, I love you. I love Sigma. And he said, that's what it was. And he said, him and the brothers from Zeta Kappa went up to uh, North Carolina for the conclave for one of those years. And, you know, he was a big Parliament P-Funk fan, you know, all that funk music from the 70s. And they were always doing this. And he said they went up there as a chapter and they were partying, doing this. And he said, brothers just caught on and we're doing this. And he said it just spread. And he said, but it was nothing, you know, really significant, nothing well thought out. And he never thought to this day or to that day that, you know, it would be that big. And it's funny when I set up the museum no matter where it is, whatever room it's in, Granberry would always come by, spend some time in there and visit. And there would be some younger brothers in there. And as soon as I saw Granberry, I would say, oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Remember you asked me about the hand sign? You see that brother over there? He's the one that originated it. And Granberry, just being as humble as he was, would just put his head down, shake his head, take a deep breath, and say, all right, brothers, come on over. I'll tell you the story. And he would just tell the story and share his experiences. And the brothers would all take pictures with them and everything. And I mean, it was just one of those things. But I, I would always put Granberry on the spot. Because, <laughs> I mean, that was 
one of those times that you know you don't want to pass up that opportunity that's the man right there so <laughs> that's the story gotcha rose yeah. any additional ones well i got one that uh conclave you just mentioned in north carolina i believe it was in the early 70s it was at Winston, in winston-salem north carolina at the old robert e lee hotel well it was it was probably in the 80s early 80s because granbury crossed in like 76 and he said it was after he crossed so i remember him telling me north carolina but i'm not i could look at the conflict programs probably then, wasn't it. i'm sorry that's all right well it, it might have been raleigh the conclave that was held in raleigh north carolina I think yeah, it was, uh, yeah that would have been that would have been like 93 yeah so i don't but know whether it was, it was that one right before that it was before that i'm talking early 70s yeah. and uh the reason we we never went back there uh to the robert e lee is because uh we Sigma brothers got in to our heads that we didn't like Confederate battle flags. And we tore them all down before we left at the end of the conclave. And they told us if we ever came back to that town, we was all a bunch of, and you know what, it's going to jail. Yeah, man, you guys were the activists, right? Well, stuff. you know, we're from New York City, so, you know. Yeah. We take it a little differently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'm just saying. Hey, understood, John. Hey, you're picking up what you're putting down. Don't worry about it. <laughs> hey, well, bros, we have Anyone? had uh, two hours of amazing history on a Thursday night. Uh, please take yourselves off of mute. Give a thunderous applause for our international story and our own brother here, Brother Mark Pasage. Appreciate yes, you, my sir. brother. Thank you so much. Oh, my yes. brother. Oh, Thank oh, you, brother oh, Mallet. Oh, Mallet. Oh, Appreciate you. Thank you. Great job, Great Mallet. Great job. Great job. Yes. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Always nah, good picking that brain. <laughs> yeah, I was another brother that saw you in 95, and that, that kind of cemented my way in the Sigma as well down in Gainesville. Yeah, man. And you should all be life members. <laughs> there you go. Tell us that, Brooklyn. <laughs> hey, life member number 110. Yes, sir. Ooh. 110. Hey, Mallory, I do got one last, last question. You all usually finish up your uh, presentations with this one. What's up? Uh, what's written on the pages on the open book and the uh, shield? Oh, yeah. Um, for the brothers, you, you got to listen to this real close. You know, on the shield, uh, there's three books. And the book that's open, there are lines on it written. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. This is for Sigma Bros only. Those lines written is the recipe for blue juice. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's up right there, baby. That's what's up. <laughs> Big Mike. Big Mike. <laughs> Stefan Prince. Big Mike. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> <laughs> oh man some things never change yeah I love it i'm ready wow go ahead bro. that's what i'm talking about bro i'm ready <laughs> oh wait, that was a good one. <laughs> oh, bros 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 man thank you mal appreciate you my brother thank, thank you, all your brothers for joining out tonight i hope you enjoyed it uh we did tape it and so I will put out the link uh, for brothers that they can be able to watch it. And uh, uh, like I said, man, just good time tonight. I'm glad everybody was able to get on here. And remember, bros, we're going to do this again next week. Pass the information on uh, Sigmas in the Arts, a conversation about brothers, uh, you know, pursuing their passion and making it into profit. So and you, didn't, you didn't invite me to be on that one. I got to show all my artwork and everything. Bro, I'm, I, uh, we're going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Uh oh, sound like a fee coming to me. Uh, yeah. uh, hey, I got some of his pieces now. Now I got the reproductions. I can't afford the originals because you know he out of my price range. But I can't even afford my own originals. <laughs> well, bro, yeah, hey, thanks everybody for joining in. Everybody stay safe. Can't wait to see you guys in person real soon. Uh, God bless everybody. Go mob. Right, go mob. Mob. Go mob. 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 Mob.